I heard crying in the woods. Are you lost? Please, he's coming. Coming October 4th to video on demand, The Veil, a genre-bending cosmic horror from Film Frontier Studios and Buffalo 8, starring Sean O'Brien and Rebecca Kennedy. Witness the terrifying mystery that unfolds when a retired priest shelters a young Amish runaway in crisis underneath a raging solar storm. Hope I didn't wake the others. The others? I live here alone. Buy or rent The Veil October 4th on Amazon Prime Video, Apple TV, or Google Play. Have you ever seen anything like it before? Written and directed by Cameron Bile. An official Austin Film Festival and HP Lovecraft Film Festival selection. Visit www.filmfrontierstudios.com for more. No! No! Welcome to the Director Series Podcast, brought to you by Pod Frontier. I'm your host, Cameron Bile. As a filmmaker, I'm fascinated by the endless ways to tell a story in pictures, and I find my inspiration in films by great directors. The Director Series is a project that's grown out of this love, whereby I can trace the dramatic through line of a given filmmaker's career while breaking down the unique components of their craft. This podcast aims to continue this mission, shedding new light on your favorite films and filmmakers, while opening the door to a much wider world of cinematic possibility. When I was in middle school, a family friend took me to a work conference she thought would be right up my alley. A new technology was on display at this conference, high definition video. And it promised nothing short of a revolution in motion picture making. The screens were huge, and thin. The colors were searing. The clarity was unreal, like looking through a window. An all-digital screening of Toy Story 2 later that day proved the medium's viability as a replacement for old-fashioned film projection at a fraction of the cost. I witnessed the future that day, and in the years since, digital video has lived up to its revolutionary promise at breathtaking speed. I wasn't the only one who found themselves completely taken by this brave new world. High-profile early adopters like Steven Soderbergh, David Fincher, and George Lucas famously jumped feet first into the opportunities afforded by digital, while each of those aforementioned filmmakers have played a significant part in cementing digital as cellulite film's 21st century successor. One director stands out for his particularly unique embrace of the format. Michael Mann. Mann distinguishes himself by not trying to replicate the filmic experience, but by embracing the unique technical and textural opportunities of digital as its own unique format. He has built a career and generated a handful of contemporary crime classics out of his obsessive need to channel the icy coolness of his character's psyches while maintaining total authenticity in what he was depicting. Most directors have to choose between whether they want to be subjective or objective storytellers, but Mann has found a way to keep one foot in both realms. In a 2018 article for Oscilloscope Pictures, critic Bilga Abiri would put forth an intriguing insight by writing, when video liberated Mann, it also turned him, in some ways, into a different director. One focuses much on the textural possibilities of cinema, as much as its narrative ones. Indeed, the advent of digital has had a transformative effect on man's artistic worldview. He made the switch right around the turn of the millennium, capturing the bulk of his feature output during the tech's most formative years. From 2001's Ali to 2023's Ferrari, man's late career features are in constant dialogue with the very medium on which they're made, inventing new visual languages wholesale by embracing the technology's strengths and flaws and by never pretending it's something it's not. These are his most experimental, most passionate films, designed to push his tools to their outermost limits. Over the course of two decades and six features, Mann has used digital technology to remake himself from the kingpin of cops and robbers cool into a consummate artist, fueled entirely by raw intuition and an emotional freedom that benefits from his granular intimacy with his subject matter.
like Tom Sizemore's Adrenaline Junkie Bank Robber says in 1995's Heat. The action is the juice. For his creator, the style is the substance. Chapter 1, Ali In a 2004 interview for American Cinematographer, Mann's frequent cameraman, Dion Beebe, described his boss as a director who prepares like Rembrandt and executes like Picasso. That is to say, his process involves immersing himself in the minutia of his subject, almost absorbing it on a molecular level, so that he can improvise on the fly, pursuing his creative whims with confidence. Shooting on film isn't quite conducive to playing jazz, requiring, requiring careful deliberation at every step in the process. With films like The Last of the Mohicans, Heat, and The Insider, Mann had mastered the art of working within these constraints to deliver beautiful, assured cinematic visions that possess the vitality of his in-the-moment inspirations. And yet, celluloid as an image-making medium could not accomplish everything Mann desired from it. While analog video had been in use for decades at this point, the looming transition to high-definition digital signals caused Mann to actively ruminate on his newfound potential to capture theatrical quality feature films. He was particularly drawn to its unique technical signature, which he would describe some years later to Vulture. Quote, There was a truth-telling style to the visuals, and the emotions were more powerful because it didn't feel theatrical. I analyzed afterwards what was going on to make me feel this way, and I realized it was because we had subtracted the theatrical lighting. Everybody unconsciously sees it and knows that it's something crafted, not something that feels real. When it came to deciding how to shoot 2001's Ali, Mann's sprawling biopic on the most celebrated boxer of all time, Mann saw an opportunity to juxtapose the organic timelessness of celluloid film against the raw immediacy of high-def video. His established ascetic lived at the intersection of evocative lyricism and an observational attention to detail bordering on straight journalism. Ali, then, becomes a kind of proving ground for the nascent digital format, with man using it sparingly and with great deliberation, all in a bid to experiment with the potential of this bold new visual language. Ali was shot mostly using conventional celluloid film cameras, specifically, the Panavision Panaflex and Millennium models that had come to be regarded as premium workhorses within the industry. Maybe 10% of the finished film, if even that, is digitally acquired footage, and is a testament to man's convictions and technical expertise that the two sources coexist so harmoniously. This being a long time before the introduction of the RED and ARRI Alexa camera systems that dominate the filmmaking landscape today. Man's options in the digital camera arena were severely limited. Working with his cinematographer, Emmanuel Chivo Lubezki, Mann would settle on Sony's Cine Alta F900 camera, which, considering that George Lucas was using the same system to shoot his Star Wars prequels, made this particular camera the highest profile option for filmmakers looking for a cinematic image. This is due in large part to the 1080p full HD resolution of its sensor, as well as the ability to shoot a true 24 frames each second to better facilitate an eventual transfer to a film print. The ability to mount cine glass to the camera body was also a major selling point, enabling man and company to keep a consistent look by using the same Panavision Prima lenses they used on the film portions. Where man would employ digital photography towards a much more thematic degree in his subsequent films, Ali's use of the format is one of occasional ascetic flourish. The opening credits are a swirl of quick-cut vignettes that drop us into the life and times of Muhammad Ali, capturing the politics and culture of an entire era in mere minutes. One of these vignettes sees Will Smith's Ali going for a moonlit run in a desolate urban environment. Man's protagonists are often framed as individuals standing in open defiance of conformist societies, and Ali's introduction as a solitary figure training with an almost monastic devotion immediately establishes him among their ranks. These shots are bracing precisely because we can immediately tell they are digital video. 
replete with the distinct noise artifacts of a digital sensor's low light capabilities being pushed to their extreme limits. What's not immediately apparent, however, is just how much we can see. Clearly delineated, cl clearly delineated clouds crossing the moon, distant buildings that are still easily distinguishable with just the ambient lighting of the street lamps. These shots might have very well been cut out from the production schedule of a film-based shoot, as the logistics and cost of lighting several city blocks to achieve the same visibility would have been too prohibitive. Ali's boxing sequences are infamously visceral, thanks in large part to Mann and Lebesky's deliberate technical choices. The lightweight nature of a video camera affords an ease of mobility that a film camera simply cannot match. As such, Mann's camera is able to step inside the ring with Ali, quite literally peering over his shoulder as he throws or receives punches. When cut together in rapid succession with the more conventional celluloid coverage, man achieves a jarring visual dichotomy that immerses us in history as it unfolds in the present tense. Man becomes myth, myth becomes man, and they both become legend. It's a powerful effect, creating a peculiar audiovisual sensation that man would return to on a much wider scale before the decade was out. Chapter 2, Collateral Having proved that high-def digital video and celluloid film could stand side by side with each other in the same film, Mann used the production of 2004's Collateral as an opportunity to dive deeper into digital's unique capabilities, notably the increased low-light sensitivity of digital sensors, which Mann has described as being capable of, quote, seeing into the night. The story of a hitman taking his cabbie hostage on a night-long contract killing spree across the Los Angeles sprawl is naturally conducive to such a technology. Indeed, the sheer expanse of lighting so many locations at night to expose for film, not to mention the format's difficulty with sharpness and focus in dark conditions, could very well have meant that collateral wouldn't get made at all. Because so much of the film would have to be shot digitally as a matter of sheer practicality, Mann and company were liberated from having to adhere to a conventional filmic look. If I'm going to use video, I want to find an aesthetic that derives from that technology, says Mann in that same Vulture article, further adding, I'm not interested in making it look like film. Indeed, collateral is anything but an emulation of celluloid. It is a different beast entirely. Mann further elaborates on his unique embrace of the digital format by using a characteristic metaphor. He references the first skyscrapers of New York, which simply look like taller versions of the masonry buildings that preceded them, before bringing up Chicago's Monadnock building as an example of the first tall building whose design stemmed from its function and materials. Collateral is the cinematic embodiment of this analogy. Using a mix of the aforementioned Sony Cinealta F900 camera, as well as the Thompson Viper Filmstream camera, the pairing of these two cameras also demonstrates the breathtaking speed at which the technology was developing. The film cinematographer, Dion Beebe, told Business Wire that the Viper became Collateral's primary camera despite man's previous familiarity with the Cine Alta. Why? It might have something to do with the Cine Alta recording to HD cam cassette tapes, whereas the Viper was one of the earliest digital cameras to offer solid state recording options. Both could be used with a suite of Zeiss Digiprime lenses, which gives collateral its razor-sharp edges and unblinking clarity. Out of collateral's countless breathtaking compositions, one image in particular stands out as Exhibit A and Man's argument for digital technology. Towards the end of the film, Tom Cruise's hitman cuts the power to one of the offices in a downtown high rise so he can stalk his prey in the dark. We see Cruz's distinctive silhouette slink through glass partitions, lit only by the ambient city lights far below, albeit with an assist from LA's notoriously light-polluted night sky. This deceptively simple image sums up Collateral's entire aesthetic, which uses the vibrant mixed lighting of After Hours LA to create a lurid foray into its seedy underbelly. Sodium vapor street lamps, harsh utilitarian fluorescence, and halogen headlights constantly collide into a kaleidoscopic rush of urban desperation 
and very real danger. A constant refrain between man and Bibi was, make the fill light the key light, meaning the filmmakers would strive to avoid directional lighting whenever possible. Instead, they harnessed both the literal and figurative electricity of the city around them, with the added depth reinforcing the built environment as a major influence in the actions that characters take. Because so much less time was devoted to setting up and adjusting artificial lights, man could more easily follow his creative whims and explore aggressively experimental compositions. For instance, he frequently stages close-ups with his subject positioned at the far edge of the frame. Combined with the sprawling depth of field inherent to a digital sensor, man turns these claustrophobic close-ups into strange landscapes, whereby the background maintains its own clarity and meshes into the contours of the human face in the foreground. The problem with being an early adopter of any technology is the inevitable period of trial and error. Collateral's distinctive look is a direct result of the unique learning curve that Mann and his collaborators experienced on set. For instance, the film's original cinematographer, Paul Cameron, was let go a quarter of the way into a 12-week shoot and replaced by Bibi. While this development certainly speaks to insurmountable creative differences between the director and his DP, it also illustrates the sheer degree to which digital tools enabled them to rewrite the filmmaking handbook. His camera's gain settings, the amount of amplification applied to the video signal, allow man to see further into the shadows at the expense of a noisier image. This results in a, quote, thinner image, devoid of the deep blacks and wide dynamic range offered by celluloid. In order to achieve the right signal to noise ratio, while his gain settings were cranked to the max, the filmmakers had to devise a workaround in which they overlit the actor's faces to an absurd degree and bring the levels back down to an acceptable range in post-production. Arguably the most controversial decision to shape Collateral's aesthetic, and nearly all of man's digital output in the years since, is the choice of shutter angle. Most films shot at 24 frames a second employ a 180 degree shutter angle, which approximates the natural motion blur of the human eye. Man was instead drawn to a shutter angle of 360 degrees, which results in an exaggerated motion blur that many find, frankly, off-putting. More than anything, this particular creative choice does the most to communicate man's desire to establish high def video's technological quirks as a creatively valid look all its own. The glitz, the glamour, the gorgeous stars descending grand staircases. You think you know about Hollywood's golden age of movie making, but what about the ghosts lurking just off screen? I'm Bianca Lopez, and I'd like to tell you a ghost story, but not just any ghost story. With our new podcast, Tinseltown Ghost Stories, I want to take you deep into the shadows of Hollywood's haunted backlots and bungalows and find the skeletons lurking in its ample closet space. Whether you live in Los Angeles or you've only seen it in the movies, you're already familiar with its countless landmarks. Places like the world-famous Hollywood sign, the legendary Pantages Theater, the sunny Santa Monica Pier, and of course, Dodger Stadium. What you might not know is that each of these iconic locales is said to be home to a spirit or two. Some are celebrated, others despised, but each one has a story to tell, and Tinseltown Ghost Stories will help tell them. In the course of our show, you'll learn about the people who built Los Angeles, the scandals that rocked the industry, and the dreams unfulfilled that still echo on the boulevard. Hollywood is more comfortable when its secrets stay hidden in the shadows. On Tinseltown Ghost Stories, we listen to what the dead have to say. Because the darkness is so much less scary when you shine a little light on it. Are you feeling like your creative career is just treading water while you wait for a ship to pass by and notice you? Maybe it's time for you to make your own ship. Hi, I'm Kyle F. Andrews. Listen to Make Your Shit 
my Creative Empowerment Podcast. Every week, we chat with industry pros and up-and-coming artists alike about how they made their shit in hopes that it helps you make yours. Follow us on your favorite podcatcher or go to patreon.com forward slash podfrontier for more. Chapter 3, Miami Vice Now that high-definition video's capabilities have been proven in the theatrical space, to man standards at least, he wanted to see what the format was capable of in a diverse array of environments. The operating question was now, can the style become the substance? In other words, can the visual characteristics of the video format become an aesthetic onto itself that heightens the themes at play in the actual narrative? In the mid-2000s, a curious trend emerged in which studios remade old television shows as revisionist theatrical features. Reinterpretation of Miami Vice, the seminal cop drama that helped to define 80s pop culture, seemed to be a no-brainer. To have Mann, who actually created the original show, back behind the camera, was a slam dunk. Anyone else would have attempted to recreate the pastel suits, neon lights, and sleek, sun-dappled, cosmopolitan romance of the beloved TV series. But Mann had a much different idea in mind. He wanted to reinvent the property's crime-pop visuals, and seeing as the vast majority of film and TV was still captured on photochemical film, digital video represented an opportunity to build a whole new pictorial style from scratch. With Collateral, there was a clear reason to harness the emerging tech they could take advantage of the sensor's low-light capabilities to see further into the night. With Miami Vice, the intent was calibrated to more of an expressive register, rather than a technical one. In his commentary track for the film, Mann clarifies his personal attraction to the idea, citing a potential for a, quote, burnished, sun-baked energy that digital could capture in the daylight sequences. The scale was larger, more sprawling, and offered the opportunity to shoot in a wide variety of environments and lighting scenarios. Miami Vice has us following these updated iterations of the classic cop duo Crockett and Tubbs across the flat expanse of Florida, from Miami's glittering skyscrapers to the endless blue oceans to the exotic lushness of Cuba and beyond. Their attempts to infiltrate and take down a Colombian drug cartel are rendered within a spectrum of visual interest and diversity the ultimate proving ground for the digital format. In his New York Times review for the film, critic A.O. Scott describes the unique texture that results, quote, the depth of focus, the intensity of color, and the grainy smudged finish of some of the images combine to create a look that is both vividly naturalistic and almost dreamlike. Indeed, dreamlike is an apt if perhaps unexpected, way to describe returning cinematographer Dion Beebe's footage. Despite using the same Sony Cine Alti camera and Digiprime lenses used on Collateral, Miami Vice immediately distinguishes itself from its predecessor in that it is conspicuously lit. An undercover meeting with John Ortiz's cartel lieutenant in a shadowy hideaway is a prime example of the heightened style at play throughout. There is a higher degree of contrast, which combined with the decreased dynamic range relative to modern digital sensors, results in very little room for error in the exposure. Mann's audio commentary also highlights the unique challenges of shooting this way, which is described as an inversion of how celluloid-versed camera crews work. Whereas celluloid demands protecting the black portions of the frame from inadvertent exposure, Video crews would need to protect the white portions of the image from the clipping or loss of detail that comes from overexposure. Their efforts aren't entirely successful throughout. Highlights are blown. Shadow detail is obscured by electronic noise. But when they get it right, the frame pops with incredible texture and color. Miami Vice offers heretofore unseen details in clouds or captures the electric purple quality of Miami's night sky sometimes quite literally, given the region's propensity for frequent lightning storms. These details contribute to an immersiveness, a tangible sense of the environment and the effect it has upon the characters. Mann's films are unique in that they prioritize this intimate relationship between a character and his environment. For example, 
He is as much a cross-section of LA's infrastructural and law enforcement topology as it is a cops and robbers chase story. The built environment of Miami Vice contains less freedom. Contained as it is within the Floridian Peninsula and the murky international waters just beyond its shoreline. Man sets the action in sleek condo towers, speeding vehicles on empty roadways, foreboding industrial ports, lavish cartel compounds, and many other locales that have a distinct shape or structure that hems in the characters and dictates their choices or actions. There's a sense of predestination to the proceedings governed and controlled by a natural world rendered in exacting digital detail. The local is made mythical, with Crockett and Tubbs not so much fighting for justice as they are fighting for transcendence. They are achingly aware of their existence within the here and now, because in their line of work, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Miami Vice retains the unusual 360-degree shutter angle that gives the film its smeary motion blur, but that's only the tip of the iceberg in what is easily one of the most radically experimental action films to come out of the studio system in decades. The image is muddy and vibrant at the same time, each pixel given a life of its own. Man and company embrace abnormal color temperatures, such as a scene set at a diner about 48 minutes in, wherein the overhead fluorescence casts the action in a magenta hue. Mann explains this choice a little more in his commentary, noting how they tweaked the color temperature of interior lights as a way to suggest foreign locations. He recounts his observation that, in Paraguay, the light bulbs run more red in color than our domestic tungsten bulbs. This observation is put into practice throughout Miami Vice, giving each locale its own distinct color profile. Mann's experimentation is on further display in the film's climactic shootout which the director stages as a free-range assault at an abandoned shipyard. He shoots the chaos with shades of black on black, letting the sensor's low-light sensitivity make out abstracted shapes that are briefly illuminated by the headlights of parked cars or the muzzle flashes from their high-caliber firearms. Like Cruz's shark-suited predator in the climax to Collateral, they are lethal shadows moving in the dark the perfect visual summation of a narrative morality that deals in shades of gray. With their inherent malleability, digital tools afford man ever more opportunity to wring thematic significance and emotional resonance out of cosmetic asceticism. Miami Vice makes no effort to recapture the iconic style of the TV series because man is not a nostalgic storyteller. He is a forward thinker poised on the cutting edge and able to find the oblique beauty in the chaos of the now. In returning to the property that made him a household name, he's not taking a victory lap. He's recontextualizing an iconic text for a brand new era, full of uncertainty and danger. Chapter 4, Public Enemies The difference between celluloid film images and video images is like the difference between poetry and newspaper reporting, writes Frank Beaver, a retired professor of film and TV at the University of Michigan. In other words, film could be said to represent the romance of the past, while HD video captures the immediacy of the present. Man's ascetic takes this sentiment to heart, but also shows that these two mediums don't have to live in conflict with each other. The production of 2009's Public Enemies Man's pulse-pounding chronicle, The Manhunt for Notorious Criminal John Dillinger, was an opportunity to explore this idea all the way to its logical conclusion, sustaining that air of immediacy for the length of an entire feature film. That said, Man's deployment of digital on public enemies wasn't always a given, even despite his high-profile advocacy for the format on Collateral and Miami Vice. A period piece such as this cries out for the lush cinematic treatment that had previously been the exclusive domain of celluloid. Mann and his cinematographer Dante Spinotti certainly flirted with the idea, even going so far as to shoot a series of camera tests with vintage cars on a backlot in order to discern the advantages of both formats in such a context. The tests quickly revealed that digital was the clear choice to achieve Mann's particular vision. Public enemies would utilize the next generation of Sony Cine Alta cameras that Mann and company had become so familiar with, supplementing that package by shooting select shots on a Sony PMW EX1, a handheld 
off-the-shelf prosumer camcorder that further spoke to the promise of digital as the key facilitator of filmmaking's democratization. Despite the cutting-edge tech on display throughout, Public Enemies is an inherently divisive film characterized by man's refusal to indulge in nostalgia. Like the in-media res nightclub sequence that opens Miami Vice, Public Enemies drops us right into the thick of 1933. Man's handheld camera work reinforces the film's sense of immediacy, evoking the style of documentary, complete with extreme, hastily composed compositions that suggest the camera operator reacting to history unfolding in the present tense instead of recreating it. Nimble lighting setups allow Mann and Spinotti to do more with less, facilitating quick turnarounds and maximizing their coverage. Considering all the time needed to recreate a certain time or place on a conventional shoot, Mann's approach affords him ample opportunity to jazz with the material once it's up and running. Befitting a film about the moral ambiguities of a charismatic bank robber and the lawman who has to bend the law itself to stop him, Public Enemies uses digital's low light sensitivity to create a unique chiaroscuro, the interplay between light and dark. Beams of hard overhead light, seen in scenes like the opening prison break, create deep wells of shadow that obscure characters' eyes and their intentions. Another example is the mid-film shootout sequence at the rustic Little Bohemia Lodge, set entirely in the black of night like Miami Vice's climactic shootout before it. This sequence illuminates the action with pointed, motivated lighting sources like car headlights, muzzle flashes, and the wan light of the moon poking through the trees. Indeed, Public Enemies is one of the few period films to accurately show us just how dark certain environments were be it the woods in the middle of the night, or inside of a modest home in the middle of a sunny day. The built environment has always played an active role in man's films, and the architecture of these period-specific dwellings imposes a distinct darkness. Windows were smaller, light bulbs were dimmer, and there were definitely no compact fluorescent cans in the ceiling blasting a room with bright, shapeless light. Open concept floor plans were also decades away, leading to enclosed chambers that literally walled off natural daylight. It's all another instance of the hyper-attention to detail and texture that sets man apart from his contemporaries. That same level of detail, however, proves to be Public Enemy's Achilles heel. For all the film's strengths, on a technical level, as well as the impeccable costuming and production design, the limitations of man's chosen tools become painfully apparent. Under perfect conditions, the early Sony Cine Alti HD cameras could deliver footage that stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with film. But when one is working on the uttermost bounds of exposure and composition as man is wont to do, the illusion starts to fall apart. The advantages of digital, its clarity and sharpness, require an exaggerated degree of fidelity to period details and textures. Without the romantic, softened edges of film, there is nowhere to hide. The resultant increase in clarity walks a fine line between complete immersiveness and a strange hyper-reality, whereby the audience becomes painfully aware they are watching actors in costumes. It doesn't help matters that man insists on his 360-degree shutter speed, which imbues the image with a smeary motion blur. Public Enemies is an admirable experiment, but it's also a missed opportunity. Man's insistence on a tool that wasn't quite ready for the rigorous paces of a historical crime drama robs the story of its historical gravitas. Indeed, it seemed Man had finally pushed this exciting new technology to its breaking point, beyond the point where we could safely suspend our disbelief. Chapter 5, Black Hat. With the passage of six years between Public Enemies and the 2015 release of Man's follow-up, Black Hat, there was a substantial window for digital technology to improve to such a degree that it could truly achieve visual equivalence with film. This window saw the swift rise of camera systems from RED and ARRI. Their 4K-capable sensors had been almost universally adopted into the industry upon arrival. The digital revolution was effectively over. Now that digital footage was virtually indistinguishable from film, 
the technological characteristics and aesthetic quirks that had distinguished digital video were no longer immediately apparent. These, quote, flaws had been ironed out in the pursuit of a pristine, crystal clear image. This presented something of an existential challenge for man, as his entire ascetic philosophy over the past decade had been rendered immaterial. But a challenge is nothing if not opportunity, and man would use the production of Black Hat as a testbed for the new possibilities that the digital film parody had opened up. Whereas his previous three films had leaned on the Sony Cine Alti camera, Black Hat finds man embracing full camera agnosticism. It was no longer about which camera was right for the job, but what camera was right for the shot. A multitude of options had sprung up during his absence from set, each with their own distinct capabilities and use applications. Whether he needed an A cam, a B cam, or even a disposable crash cam, man had no shortage of cameras to choose from. As such, he uses several, resulting in an unencumbered final product with subtle variations in image texture, achieved through the strategic combination of industry workhorses like the Arri Alexa ST and cheap off-the-shelf consumer cameras like Canon EOS DSLRs, GoPros, and the Scarlet, Red's earliest entry-level offering. Man and his cinematographer, Stuart Dryberg, would capture Black Hat in a spectrum of picture resolutions and finish out as a 2K digital intermediate, unifying these distinct sensors with anamorphic glass from Hawk and Anjanu. Black Hat immediately asserts a revised aesthetic because of these advances. While it's still present in fleeting instances, the smeary motion blur that characterized Miami Vice and Public Enemies is downplayed because there isn't much need to shoot at a 360 degree shutter angle. There has been an increase in the for lack of a better term, integrity of the motion at higher ISOs. At the same time, he and Dryberg enjoy an increased ability to utilize the ambient light, resulting in softer key lights and a shallower depth of field. There's very little noise, save for the darkest exposures. Black Hat also makes use of the fact that digital speed ramping features had massively improved since his last go-round allowing for man to tap into the casual grace notes, allowing for man to tap into the casual grace notes afforded by his scene staging. Indeed, there's a loose, jazzy vibe to the entirety of Black Hat's execution. Many times it feels like there's no rhyme, reason, or unifying principle as to why man composes any given frame the way he does, but they are nonetheless striking. They're emotionally intuitive if not necessarily logical or formalized. In his piece for Vulture on the film, critic Bilga Abiri writes, the immaculate aesthetics of his earlier films have been replaced by something less composed, more unhinged. Cameras often follow characters close along their heads, as if trying to see from behind their eyes. Perspective fragments among different characters and many, many different angles of a scene Seemingly stolen shots jut up uncomfortably against what sometimes looks like surveillance footage. This is all a way for a man to bring the audience even deeper into the headspace of his protagonists, who are often dealing with the ennui of alienation and isolation, and are positioned as solitary figures facing off against faceless bureaucratic or institutional forces much bigger than themselves. In other words, man is trying to find the human and the imperfect in an increasingly digitized and optimized world, balancing a digital camera's technical precision and clarity against the flexibility and ease of use that allows him to capture images at the speed of spontaneous inspiration. He can charge into microscopic imagery of computer circuits or go wide to capture our globalized urban centers in their entirety, which Abiri, writing for Oscilloscope now, describes as drawing an explicit connection between the nano imagery of the cyber realm and the macro imagery of the cityscape. Having mastered the learning curve of digital tech, man's storytelling has evolved along the same arc as computer technology itself, becoming an extension of his own hand and distilling his voice into ever more intuitive and emotional registers. Chapter six, Ferrari. With the release of his most recent film, 2023's Ferrari, Man essentially comes full circle in his decades-long experiment in digital cinema, 
The film, a rip-roaring portrait of Enzo Ferrari in the midst of a career-defining race in 1957, takes the lessons learned and incorporates them back into a form that more closely resembles the stately, classical ascetic of his celluloid-based work. To put it another way, there is no need for man to aggressively distinguish between the aesthetics of film and digital because, by 2023, the two formats have become nearly indistinguishable. After man's embrace of the Ari Alexa and red camera systems for Black Hat, the occasion of Ferrari's production finds man returning to the Sony Cine Alta line, albeit now a drastically different beast than the tech he first used on Ali. Sony's cameras, now integrated into a line of powerful cinematic offerings that boast distinct advantages as well as an aesthetic consistency between them, are joined by man and cinematographer Eric Messerschmidt's strategic deployment of the red V-Raptor and red Komodo cameras, the latter further distinguished by its initial development as a $6,000 crash cam that filmmakers could destroy with gleeful abandon. Ferrari uses these cameras for that very purpose, strapping them to the eponymous period race cars and whipping along at breakneck speed. Digital cinematography had progressed to the point that footage could be captured on a variety of different sensors and be made to match seamlessly in post-production. Whether that's through colorists harmonizing the multiple color sciences of different sensors or wrangling a variety of resolutions into a single 4K digital intermediate, the industry has generally seemed to follow along with man's practice of deploying certain cameras based on the needs of a particular shot. This leaves the deliberate, artistically motivated differences intact, like the key dichotomy that characterizes Ferrari, that of the classical stateliness of the dialogue sequences against the dynamic rush of the racing scenes. The former looks to the dramatic, drapey shadows and intense light of Italian Renaissance paintings, while the latter employs improvisational, off-the-cuff camera work and compositions to highlight the split-second, reactionary nature of high-speed racing, and thus the inherent, vitality-affirming appeal it holds for the title character. Conclusion The back half of Mann's esteemed filmmaking career has positioned his legacy as that of a trailblazer, a key player in the evolution of what promises to be the dominant image-making format of the 21st century. Much like his TV series Miami Vice established our collective definition of 80s cool, so too does his work over the past quarter century establish the visual language of our modern era. Because of man, it's no longer just about the what of a digital frame. It's also about the how and the why. Despite their checkered reception, Man's digital films have paved the way for aspiring and emerging filmmakers of all stripes, giving them the permission to use accessible tools to reintroduce emotional intuition into visual storytelling. Now, thanks to the evolution of smartphones, we have 4K cinema quality cameras in our pockets. If our phones can be said to be extensions of ourselves, then we now have a direct organic line to showing the world what's in our heads. If we take anything away from man's latter-day output, let it be this. Digital cinema is not so much about telling a story as it is about effortlessly sharing a worldview. And expressing himself accordingly, man has given us the tools and the courage to do the same and has set the stage for a richer media landscape in which we can all participate. Thank you for listening to the Director Series podcast. Brought to you by Pod Frontier. This episode was produced by Cameron Bile and Kyle F. Andrews and co produced by Emily Castro. Our director and production supervisor is Morgan Rudder. Our audio engineer is Alyssa Rose, recorded at Honeydew Studios in North Hollywood. If you need more director series in your life, be sure to check out our website at www.thedirectorseries.com. <laughs>